Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God that we wish to consider for ourselves this morning is found and quoted for us in Matthew chapter 10. Allow me to highlight for you verse 26a. So do not be afraid of them. Thus far, God's word lets you and I continue with prayer. Oh, gracious and merciful Father, we come to you and we thank you for the wonderful gift you have given to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But help us, dear Lord, not to take him for granted, not to think that we're above him or beyond him, not to think that somehow he doesn't pertain to our lives anymore. Help us to grasp, dear Lord, that we should not, not be afraid of the world, but that we should revere and honor your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. So did you see what I saw in our text for this morning, this, this particular text that's before us? Seriously, when I sat down and I took a look at this text, I, I recognize that I preached on this text at least two other times, and yet I have to tell you that for the first time only now did I find a phrase that just, it just absolutely stuck out at me. And you can tell what I saw by the text that I highlighted. It's that idea of not being afraid. So did you note that the word fear as in afraid is used four times in this particular section? Three times it is used in that sense with the idea of do not be afraid. And the other use of the word is a clear and concise call to be afraid pretty interesting words, especially in the context in which they occur. The context is Jesus sending out his disciples. He's sending them out to preach and teach the wonders and awe of the glory of the kingdom of God. It's the beginning of the ministry for the disciples, and it's about a year into the ministry of Jesus. He sends them out, and it's clear that he wants them and us to hear and to get a very important lesson in our lives. So let's you and I just jump in and see what we can learn. Our theme will be to be or not to be afraid. Now remember what I told you already. The text is one that occurs about a year into the ministry of Jesus. The disciples have been picked and they've had now about a year of training. Numerous miracles have taken place. So, for instance, water has been turned into wine. The draft of fish has been caught in the Sea of Galilee. And after that miracle, there have been numerous, uh, a whole bunch of miracles that have been performed, impressive miracles performed by the hand of Jesus. And the truth of the matter is, at this point, people are flocking to Jesus because they want to hear, they want to see what more Jesus can do. And despite the fact that everything looks good and positive and upbeat, please note that Jesus now sends out his disciples and it is clear he's giving them an important task. But the task is not in the gathering of people. They were already coming. The task is not in the fact that the disciples will now do miracles in the name of Jesus. By the way, miracles that will not continue their whole ministry. The task is really in understanding the task. And Jesus lays out the task in these words. Student is not above his teacher, nor is a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like the teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? What? Pastor, you said the task was in understanding the task. Well, what exactly is it that we are to understand? Well, just have to go back and read that text again and really contemplate it. And the first thing to grasp is that you are not Jesus. You will not be better than him. You will not be smarter than him. You will not have a better grasp of this world. You will not have a better grasp of sin in this world. You will not have a better idea of how to bring people to him than he did. 
And although it hasn't happened yet in the life of Jesus, note also that he makes it clear by these words that you will not escape the way that the world treated Jesus. Because eventually he is despised and ridiculed and rejected and hung on the cross. In other words, you must always remember Remember that you are the student and servant and you are not the Lord and Master. And if the world hated and rejected Jesus, don't you grasp that is exactly, exactly what you can expect as a follower of Jesus. I mean, really, what makes you think you will escape such things? What makes you think that you're going to bring in thousands or even the hundreds that Jesus did not? What you need to grasp is that the world is going to stand opposed to you. And it's after Jesus clearly lays that out that Jesus then says very clearly, so do not be afraid of them. He is telling you that your Christian life may just be pretty tough going. But please note that Jesus is not finished with this lesson. He goes on. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. But I tell in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roots. Now with those words, again, you are being told to humble yourself and to keep, you know, to keep yourself in that position as student and servant. Because that's what we are. You need to keep that in mind for yourself. You're the student and the servant. And then just recognize the other fact that's very clear in this text. God knows everything. He knows everything about the world and the people of the world. He knows the plans and the plots of Satan and his children. He knows the deceptions and the lies of the false prophets in the church. He knows how the world is going to tempt and lure you. And you need to grasp that nothing is hidden or out of the power of God. Your job is to remain a student and a servant. Your job is to speak the enlightening wisdom of God to proclaim what is given to you because you need to make no mistake. These words are marvelous and wonderful. These words are awesome in every way. You need to make sure that you're not going to back down from the clear and concise truth that Jesus Christ is God and Lord. That his word is absolute truth and that it is he, he who defines and sets forth what will be and when it will be and always this will be for the good and salvation of souls. But note the next line. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. You see, with those words, Jesus is telling us that there will be, there will be such a time when these things will happen. You will lose your life for the name of Jesus. You will suffer and be persecuted. And Jesus is not only warning his direct disciples of this, by the way, all of them but John died martyr's death, but he is especially warning all, all the generations of God's children to come what could possibly be. And did you note that in, or do you know that in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus will apply these words to our coming world? In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus tells us that before he comes again, persecutions and attacks against the faith will become so severe. Well, let me just tell you what verses 21 and 22 of Matthew 24 say. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. I'm going to tell you point blank that I believe those words may be found true 
in the lives of the generations of those who are currently alive. And then Jesus says to us very clearly, do not be afraid. And let's continue with this idea. And I'm going to stick with that idea of not being afraid. Jesus continues with these words. Are not two sparrows sold for penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I don't know about you, but I find a great deal of comfort in these words. The lowly sparrow, the lowly sparrow is sold two for a penny. And you need to grasp that that lowly sparrow is in the hand, and that lowly sparrow is in the plan of God. And if that's true, then why should I, a human being, why should I, the very crown of God's creation, ever worry or be afraid about anything. We are even told that the very hairs of your head are all numbered and they're accounted for. And since God knows with intimate details the life of a hair, then dear people, what does that say about God's care for you, his child? And yes, God cares for you. And you need to remember, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus who will give his life as the atoning sacrifice for you. Jesus who will go through the passion there to suffer the eternal wrath and anger of God the Father for all the sins of all the world, for all the time, just so you don't have to. Do you not grasp the wonder and marvel of what God has done for you? Do you not see his love and care, his compassion and grace in your life? Now, if you are undergoing some sort of trial, maybe an illness, some other sort of difficulty, if you are undergoing some sort of tribulation, we know that those can come in any way, shape, or form. And if because of those things you somehow have got the idea into your head that God does not care for you or that God does not love you, then you have sorely and you have sadly missed the wonder of what's being said here. Because if God cares for sparrows and knows every one of them that falls, and if God cares for hares and has them numbered and knows every one of them that falls, Again, don't you grasp how much he will care for you, his child. That God for you will act and move. That he will guide and direct your life for your eternal good. Do you lack faith in God? Do you doubt his power or do you doubt his will for your soul? These words remind us that our God, our God is right there. He's there for us and he's with us all the time. And his majestic power and his loving grace is right there. Oftentimes in ways you cannot fully grasp and truly appreciate, but I'm telling you, it's there. He's with you and taking care of you and watching over you. And what God tells you in his word, you are to believe. Dear people, it's, it's that simple. Because that's what faith is all about. Believing what God has said and revealed. <laughs> but now we need to get to the hard part of this text. And it really is a very solemn warning for us. You see, Jesus has just spent a great deal of time telling you that you need to trust him. You need to trust his father. You need to stick to the clear and precise word of God. 
And literally, you need to pay no attention to this world and what it is doing, even though it may cost you your life. And Jesus has done this because he knows, he knows that though he tells us not to be afraid of such things, he knows that by nature we will be. So Jesus also puts in a clear and a rather forceful way, he puts in this reminder for us to make sure that our faith is justly and rightly placed. And so he says to us, rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Now first things first. If you are going to be afraid, and it's a choice between God and the world, at least be afraid of the right thing. Be afraid to offend. Be afraid of turning away from the Lord our God. Be afraid of losing the precious eternal light that God has given. Because to your people, make no mistake. God is going to send those unbelieving, rejecting, false faith souls of this world to hell. And hell is not just going to be a few years like this world. Hell is going to be eternal. So make sure you get this. If you are going to be afraid, then at least have the brains to be afraid of the almighty, all-knowing, present, everywhere, God. To be afraid of God, dear people, is to be willing, to be willing with his strength to endure everything and anything for the sake of his name. So I say, world, if you feel the need to kill me, will you just go right ahead? Because life in this world is not the measure of things. The measure of things is life in the next world, his eternal kingdom. That's how we measure things, not, not this world. World, if you are going to hate me because I have faith in Jesus and his saving love, well then you just go right ahead. Because that's what you did to him and world, I am his servant. And I am his student. World, if you are going to try to get me to abandon God's truth, to turn away from the fact that the Bible is, is God's word, and it's true in everything, then you take your best shot. Because I will not fail to acknowledge the wonder and power of God's word and the revelation of Jesus Christ, my Savior. I will stand upon his holy name. I will confess his divinity and his love, and I will live his ways. And my mouth and my life will be the image of Jesus in accord with his goodness and in accord with his grace and his love poured out upon me and all those who are his. In other words, my fear of the Lord leads me to acknowledge him and to trust him no matter what. But do notice that we are warned not to fail to acknowledge him. In other words, warned not to disown him. And dear people, we're not speaking about those everyday sins. We're not speaking about those downfalls of our sinful nature that, you know, that we wrestle with every day. We know about those. Here we are speaking really of deliberately, intentionally, and persistently disowning Jesus and what he is. The fact that he is God 
and Lord. You see, you cannot buy your life. You cannot by your actions tell Jesus he is worthless. You cannot despise his worship and praise. You cannot refuse to give him glory and honor in his church because you don't think you need it. I thought you were the servant and student. And remember, God the Father and Jesus are the ones who gave us church. So be in it and be a part of it. You cannot determine to be immoral, to live the way the world wants you to live, and to realize, because you need to realize that in doing so, you have disowned Jesus. You have told him to take his ideas and his thoughts on morality, and his ideas and his thoughts on right and wrong, and for him to go to hell. And I don't care how you logic it out, how you reason it out, dear people, that's not faith on any level. You cannot decide what parts of the Bible are true and what parts aren't. To do so means that you have decided that you can design your own God, that you can fix the mistakes that God made in giving his word and wisdom. Again, I thought you were the student and the servant not the teacher and master. You cannot, for the sake of personal fame, for the sake of so-called growth in church, for the sake of making Jesus popular or his message popular, change the truth of Jesus or water down his truth in any way. You cannot claim to be his voice all the while denying his voice. You cannot coddle to, and you cannot chase after the ways of the world and still declare that you belong to Jesus. Shall I go on with the ways that we can, or especially that the world often does show that it disowns Jesus? And most often, this happens because we fail to fear the Lord. We fail to really grasp that He is God and we are not. And dear people, if such is the case in your life, well, then I plead with you to get back to Jesus and what He's all about. I plead with you to see your sin. Stop that sin. And to realize that in Jesus and through Jesus, your sin will be forgiven because you will be brought to genuine repentance. And then, in full and wonderful forgiveness, you start anew to live your life to Jesus, to trust in Him, to acknowledge Him, to know His love and grace, His compassion and mercy in your life, to realize without reservation that Jesus is God and Lord and the Savior of your soul. Dear people, if in sending out the disciples to the world for the very first time, Jesus knew the need for the potency of the words before us, well then how much more do we today need to hear them and to heed them? Do not be afraid of the world. Do not be afraid of the things of the world. Do not be afraid even of simple physical death. I say trust in the Lord and believe in his wonder and his marvel. And know that Jesus is with you and he is working for your eternal good and salvation. Amen.